Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Rick Trainer, principal of King's College London, and it's my great pleasure to introduce this Reporting Europe event, uh, which has been organized by our Europe in Crisis project. In a moment, my colleague, Anna Menon, who's a professor uh, at King's, uh, is going to introduce this event in detail, but I'd just like to give a little bit of background on the project and King's general interest in Europe in general and the European Union in particular. Uh, it's a truism, of course, that um, uh, Europe is important, not least the European Union itself. And King's devotes a lot of academic attention to this range of subjects. Uh, we have a Department of European Studies, we have a Department of Political Economy, which is concerned with these subjects among many others, and we have a range of other uh, departments in our School of Arts and Humanities and our School of Social Science and Public Policy, which also deal in various ways with European matters, both in teaching and in research. And the King's Policy Institute, which is affiliated to the School of Social Science and Public Policy and has a particular concern with the European Crisis Project, um, is also attempting to focus um, internally and to project externally uh, King's interest in uh, public policy uh, matters. All this fits very well with the most fundamental mission of the college, which is service to society. That certainly characterizes the Europe in Crisis uh, Project which is uh, jointly organized by Annan, who I've already referred to, who's Professor of European Politics and Foreign Affairs, and also by uh, Sir Nigel Scheinwald, former British Ambassador to the United States, who is now a visiting Professor at King's. The European Crisis Project is a three-year initiative uh, which aims to tease out the medium-term political, economic, and international implications of the crisis in the European Union, attempting to promote debate about the impact of this crisis on both the European Union and its constituent member states, and not least uh, looking for policy solutions. So it's in that context um, uh, that uh, my colleagues are mounting this evening uh, this reporting a Europe event on the assumption, which I'm sure will be amply justified by the event, uh, that the reporting angle, the media angle, on European uh, crisis issues is one that richly deserves investigation. So you're all very welcome to this event, um, whether you are explicit uh, students of Europe or not. And uh, without further ado, I'm going to hand over to Annan, who in turn is going to introduce the speakers. Well, many thanks indeed. Uh, when Tony Blair, back in 2006, talked about the frenzied nature of the media coverage of Europe in this country, I assume he didn't necessarily have uh, media outlets represented on the stage in mind when he did so. Uh, but what his speech did do was point to the role that media plays in shaping what we say and how we think about the European Union. And at this time, more than any other, with a referendum, The role of the media is, I think, particularly important. And this poses several questions. How do media outlets, in particular, those outlets like the BBC, maintain impartiality? How much time do they devote to reporting on what happens in the EU itself, as opposed to what people are saying about the EU and who is in the EU in the nation state? Those are some of the questions that I hope we'll be able to tackle today. The format of the event is as follows. Each uh, of the panelists is going to give a short presentation following the two closing and open and hope to have a lively question and answer session. Just to introduce our panelists very, very quickly indeed. George Parker was formerly the Brussels correspondent of the Financial Times and is now political editor at that newspaper. John Pink, at the far end, is the Europe editor of The Economist. Next to him is Nick Robinson, who is the BBC's political editor, and to my left is Bruno Waterfield, who has been the Brussels correspondent of The Telegraph since 2007. I think we've agreed that we're going to go in alphabetical order. So, George, without further ado, I'll hand over to you. Thanks, Alan. And uh, thanks very much for inviting me. And it's a, I'd say, a very timely task to look at the way the media covers Europe. And there's something about the European Union which seems to bring out some strange 
character trait in journalists. Um, when I worked in Brussels in 2000, started working in 2002, I started writing about um, what appeared to me to be a fairly good story, which was the new EU chief accountant, who had only been in post for about six months, was refusing to sign off the European Union accounts. That seemed to be a fairly good, good story, especially after she was sacked for failing to sign off the accounts. When I started raising questions about this at the um, European Commission daily briefing, I found myself for the first time in my journalistic career being heckled by fellow journalists. Uh, which made me realise actually that reporting of the European Union is a, is a kind of strange thing. Um, I was speaking to a French journalist who told me once that in Brussels he regarded himself as a Frenchman first and a journalist second. There are lots of fairly strange ways in which journalists, when they cover the Euro European Union, they seem to detach themselves from normal journalistic standards. And I think probably um, tonight we're going to talk a bit about the way the UK press and the UK media covers the European Union. And I think that's probably a good case in point in the way that normal critical faculties, either critical faculties, regard for the truth, trying to put two sides of the story are, are put aside. Um, so I'm not starry-eyed about the European Union. When I arrived there in Brussels, as I mentioned, I was regarded as the most Eurosceptic journalist ever to be dispatched by the Financial Times to cover the EU, and very much not the thing to do. The FT was seen as very much the in-house paper of the European Union. And now I'm back in London, I'm regarded as the voice of the the Federalist, the sort of most pro-European um, journalist at Westminster. And I was fortunate working with the Financial Times in Brussels because the FT is a paper which has had a long track record of investing in Brussels, 30 years or more. The current editor of the FT was a former Brussels bureau chief. We take the story seriously, both as a political story, as an economic story, as a business story. I'm not saying the FT is faultless by any means. One of the criticisms that's often made of the FT is we in a way become too close to the institutions we covered. Um, most famously, the FT was an advocate of Britain joining the Euro. Um, and we were named as one of the guilty men recently by some of our critics, and um, we won't find all that many people at the FT who still share that view today. But by and large, the FT tries to give a fairly balanced uh, account of what's going on in Europe, a fairly, um, a fairly dense report, I think not just for the business side, but the crisis of the Euro being a good case in point. Some other newspapers, I have to say this, um, deliberately set out to misinform their readers about Europe. I would exclude the Daily Telegraph, the Guardian, um, the Times, but some other papers have a deliberate policy of misinforming their readers. Um, and a good case study of this is, look at the papers which, according to their editorials at least, believe that Brussels is running Britain. It's a very close corollary between those papers that are most convinced that Brussels is running the day-to-day -day life of Britain, and those papers which actually have a reporter stationed in Brussels to report on what's going on. Now, given the fact that Brussels is only 200 miles away, that seems to me a fairly strange state of affairs. Um, it's accounted for by two things, I think. The first thing is that actually Brussels doesn't really run Britain on a day-to-day -day basis. If you look at the top ten issues that people care about at general elections, very few of them uh, does Brussels have any direct or even indirect control over them. The second thing is, and this is where the conspiracy against the reader is most pernicious, I think, it's because if you have a reporter based in Brussels, you can see two sides of the story. You can actually go to the relevant commissioner for a response. Uh, and if you're a reporter based in Brussels, the first time you say to your news editor, I think you'll find it's a bit more complicated than that, is the day you're put on the Eurostar and brought back to England. Um, and I think you know, various papers, including the Mail and Sun, have tried to um, the experiment of having reporters out there to dig the dirt on Brussels and to expose scandals and all the rest of it, and they never last more than a few months. So it's a policy of willful, willful ignorance, really, being perpetrated by newspapers against their readers. And normal journalistic standards, for example, getting the other side of the story just doesn't seem to apply. The European Commission doesn't normally answer back, doesn't take you to the Press Complaints Commission, and as a result, the other side of the story uh, isn't put. And since I worked in Brussels, I worked in Brussels in the time of plenty in the newspaper industry when people could actually afford to dispatch people to Brussels. The problem now is compounded by the fact that we're an industry running very short of money. And the idea of sending reporters to Brussels, let alone to go to Strasbourg to cover the ludicrous travelling circus of the European Parliament, is um, becoming increasingly out of the budget of many newspapers. Um, now, the one thing I would say is that journalists like me would probably have been making this kind of whingy speech about British newspaper coverage of the EU probably at any time over the last 30 years. 
Um, it's a very difficult story for newspapers to cover. Basically, it's a city, Brussels is a city with faceless buildings inhabited by faceless characters with unpronounceable foreign names. They make decisions at a snail's pace. So we never have that sort of big moment where you know, the news desk will say, is this actually the final moment in the story? And you say, well, actually it's got to go to the Council of Ministers and then it's got to the again. So it's, it's difficult. It's a difficult story to report. But I make just three positive points about this. First thing of all, British journalists should be much more aware of what's going on in other European capitals. Get out of the mindset that um, the whole of Europe is out to get us. Follow, follow the debate in Germany about um, powers and the, where the powers lie between national capitals and Brussels. Listen to the debate about immigration in other countries. Look at what's happening in Holland where they've recently rejected the concept of ever closer union. And you'll see it's a much more complicated and interesting uh, debate going on than, than some British newspapers would allow. And I think if we covered a bit more what is going on in other national capitals, we'll have a much richer and more informed debate in this country. The second thing is, you know, there's a referendum coming up in 2017 if David Cameron has his way. Many readers, according, many voters haven't made up their minds. So for once, I think newspapers could treat their readers uh, as if they aren't fools. And so at least given both sides of the argument, I think that's a, an important thing. And the third thing I say is, although it's difficult to report Brussels, it's not, important, uh, not impossible. And I think it's really important that news organisations put their best journalists onto this story, especially in the run of the referendum. Um, because with a bit of understanding of the context, with a bit of imagination, you can get behind those faceless buildings and those faceless people and bring the whole story to life. And I'll finish on this note. I mean, some of the best journalism ever committed in Brussels uh, is by someone who is still widely vilified, I think, by lots of his colleagues or former colleagues in Brussels, but someone who used to make up stories. And it's true, this journalist did make up stories, but you can probably guess why I'm talking about Boris Johnson, the mayor of London. But although many of his stories were, uh, at the very least, pushing at the margins of truth, they were beautifully reported because the thing was Boris Johnson understood the story, he understood what made Europe tick. As you go back to some of his writing about Brussels and some of his anthologies, some of which have been repackaged under different titles with exactly the same articles in them, by the way, so don't buy too many of them. You'll see what I mean. It's, uh, there is a way of covering Brussels and the European Union which brings the story to life, and I think that's something that all journalists should probably aspire to. George, thank you very much indeed. Uh, but yes, um, thanks. And I don't want to repeat too much of what George said because I mostly agree with it. Um, I, I do think that there is a problem um, about Brussels being boring um, uh, the, and the interesting stories for readers tend to be invented stories and not real stories. Um, and it's just one of those things, I'm sure this applies to all of the media, but I think it's probably particularly true in Brussels that it's much more fun to say the Commission is trying to ban roast beef or olive oil on tables um, than to actually report on the progress of a directive through the legislative procedure. Um, uh, clearly, I think that is partly the fault of the press. The press could do more to explain things in more detail and try and, try and liven them up, and I think George is perfectly right to say that Boris Johnson was the sort of reporter who could occasionally do that. Um, the trouble is that you couldn't always tell whether he was telling the truth or not. Um, so that's, that's just a generic problem that's always been there, and it's probably got a bit worse because Brussels and the European Union have, I think, if anything, got more complicated, not less complicated, after the, the Lisbon Treaty. Um, a second thing to say is I do think that the media's ownership is of some relevance. Um, I thought uh, George has been rather kind in saying that he wouldn't, he wouldn't um, include the Telegraph in his <laughs> list of, um, of uh, groups that don't <laughs> always report Europe totally objectively. Um, uh, the, the ownership structure of the, of the British media does give a clear Eurosceptical tinge to reporting, and I don't think I think it, I think it would be foolish to deny that. The Murdoch Press is the most obvious example, and the Rothermere Press and the Express are the others, but the Telegraph also. I, I think because of the proprietors and their interests who believe very strongly in British nationalism in everything except ownership of newspapers, um, <laughs> that does give a tilt. And naturally, um, we're all human, correspondents tend to provide what editors want, and editors, editors tend to provide what proprietors want. Um, it's not um, uniform, it's not, um, it, it doesn't always work quite like that, um, but 
there is a problem about the British press that I don't think is true of most of the rest of Europe in, in terms of its, in terms of its um, ownership. Um, however, I, I, I don't want to spend the whole of this panel um, berating ourselves. I think we are very much to, to blame, we the press collectively, although I like to think that the economists and the FT are not representative of all the press. Um, I do think that this is played on by the, uh, particularly by national governments. Um, I mean, my experience in Brussels in particular was that the, the peak of interest in anything tended to be a European summit. Um, the rest of the time people weren't terribly interested in it. Um, uh, but they were interested in, in summits, particularly when there were rows going on. And the trouble with um, centering your, your views of Brussels around summits is you go to a summit, as I'm sure many of you have done, and certainly I'm sure everyone on this panel has done, and you find at the end of the summit that there are, uh, in my day it was actually um, more like 17 or 18, but now it's 28. There are 28 different press conferences given, and they all tell an essentially completely different story about what's been agreed at this summit. And naturally, the Slovenian press goes and listens to the Slovenian Prime Minister, the Danish press goes and listens to the Danish Prime Minister, <coughs> the British press goes and listens to the British Prime Minister. Actually, some foreign journalists also listen to the British Prime Minister because um, they actually understand English, whereas the British journalists don't understand any language at all. <coughs> so they get all their information from the British government. <coughs> and the trouble is that governments of both parties, it's not, this is not a, a conservative Eurosceptic problem, it's just the same when it, when it was a Labour government. They tend to want to present the story as valiant British Prime Minister battling with evil Brussels um, and fighting the rest, of the, the rest of his colleagues or her colleagues to try and get, in, in the original case where they first started with Margaret Thatcher, it was to get our money back. But later it didn't really matter what the topic was. It was something that they were trying to do Britain down on and maybe it was to take our money away again. Um, and, and we were fighting very hard and we were threatening to veto things um, uh, and, and, and in the small hours of the night we would achieve some victory over the French, over the Germans, over the Dutch it didn't really matter who it was as long as it could be presented as we win um, and I thought the best example of that by far in recent years was the small hours of December the I can't remember if it was the 9th or the 11th two, 2011 when, um, uh, when you turned on your radio to listen to the Today programme and the headline news was David Cameron vetoes EU treaty um, great triumph for uh, David Cameron. He's come out and he's stuck to his guns. He said, I'm not going to give in over this, this treaty. He, they didn't explain what the treaty was. And in fact, nobody understood what the treaty was. But I'm going to veto it because it's against Britain's interests. And this was presented as David Cameron has stopped this treaty. Uh, it did actually change during the day. It started to become, well, actually, the treaty's going to go through anyway. Uh, and, and also, by the way, the demands that David Cameron was, was, was making had nothing to do with this treaty. They were completely different, which is one of the reasons why he didn't get the others to agree to them. So the story was modified a bit during the day, including on the BBC. But the initial headline was very strongly David Cameron got, st stands up for Britain and gets what he wants. And I don't think I would entirely blame the BBC for reporting that. I think they should have um, actually been a bit more nuanced even from the beginning. But this is very much what the British government wanted the press to say. They wanted the story to be like this. So I think those who attack the press for their coverage of Europe should remember that um, there are other people who are, who are, who are driving this. And the, the, the last thing I want to say is that, although I'm blaming that bit of the picture on national governments, I think European institutions themselves are not always their best friends when it comes to, to, to reporting. Um, it is a very complicated pace, place. I don't think the Commission is always terribly good at trying to help explain it to people. Um, the European Parliament is utterly hopeless at explaining what it does or even why it exists. Um, maybe that's because of... Um, our chairman knows, some of us think it shouldn't exist. But since it's there, I think it could do a much better job of trying to set out a positive case for what it's, for what it's doing than it does. And at the moment, I am not at all surprised that the story for most people of the European Parliament is simply it's a travelling circus, it spends a lot of money, it has colossal buildings in Brussels, and uh, we'd all be better off without it. You could blame the press for some of that image, but I think I would blame the Parliament itself as well. Time for an answer, you think, to John Peter allegations. If there was only Wi-Fi or 3G, I'm trying to check my blog from the morning. David Cameron vetoed an EU treaty. If it comes through in the next second, I will discover whether John is giving a fair account. Not what I remember, John, but let's, let's, let's just see. We'll come back to it. Um, let's just come back to it. And it's, and it's, oh, there it is. How oh, interesting. I'll, I'll have a look in just a second. Um, let me say, the one thing I think that I add 
uh, to this conversation. I'm the only person who hasn't worked full-time in Brussels, I think, on this panel. So I've always been either a Westminster television producer, which I was for 10 years, or a Westminster uh, reporter, which I've been for a little more than 10 years doing it. But I have done an awful lot of Brussels. But John is absolutely right. What does that mean? It means summits. Now, as a documentary maker, I've, I've, I've been to Brussels on other occasions, but let's essentially say for news, I cover summits. And in, in a spirit of kind of self-criticism of the Westminster lobby travelling to Europe, let me just say there are a few different types of stories that the Westminster lobby is after when it goes to Brussels. There's either the wicked Eurocrat European leader. Now, in my uh, day, starting in the kind of mid-80s, that, that started with Jacques Delors, the famous Up Yours Delors headline, in the sun, and you've never seen anything quite that personal since then, but Barroso's got his fair share, Van Rompuy gets his fair share of flack, or whichever European leader at the time happens to be calling on uh, um, Europe to move in a more integrated or a more federalist direction. The second type of story there is, is Britain isolated. Now there is nothing more that a Westminster journalist loves than a Britain isolated story. It's very, very simple, there are only two sides, there's us and there's someone who's not us. <laughs> and uh, I cut my teeth at European summits chasing Jacques Chirac down corridors saying, uh, will you eat British beef, Mr. President? <laughs> uh, I also knew he spoke English, so I kept doing it in English in the hope that I could provoke him to say it in English. And if you like, there have been many variants of that story, most uh, obviously Iraq, which was once again Chirac, but uh, against Tony Blair in this case, about that sense uh, that Britain was isolated or there was a split at, at the heart of Europe. There's then, as John has just mentioned, there's the minister straight prime minister defies Brussels story, which I think he rightly says is nothing to do with politics at all in the sense of which party you're in or even whether you're pro-European or anti or sceptical. Actually, they all do it. Uh, the real specialist post thatcher was Gordon Brown. He did it at every single summit. Uh, he would uh, come out of summits and foreign uh, finance ministers and treasury ministers would discover there was all sorts of things he had said uh, that they hadn't actually heard him say, uh, as he had defied uh, the wickedness of 26 of them, or however he was when he first became Chancellor, I can't now remember, was it 13, um, in order to, to, to make sure that something didn't happen. And if you like, the Cameron veto, uh, in inverted commas, was part of, of, of that sort of thing. So there are types of stories, and I think George puts his finger on it, as to why that happened. Partly simple splits, they sell papers, they're easier to understand. Partly because people are shooting in and out of the city, don't have the chance to make their own contacts, are therefore entirely dependent on the contacts they already have, which are largely British and largely governmental, and unlike other political stories, it's not even as if you've got a government and an opposition, you've just got the government. Um, uh, Partly there's another but more boring logistical reason, which is summit summaries are often written within minutes of a summit finishing. There is very, very little time to then discover what really happened. I mean, the number of times I've been expected to give you a summary of summit conclusions, which within moments of them are being handed in my hand. I've had occasions where I've had to broadcast as they're handed into my hand. Now, you've made some calls before, but what it doesn't give you a chance is to do a great deal of processing of that information and by the time the next day comes the, the caravan has moved on. So yes, look, hands up, there are all sorts of limitations to the way that Westminster journalists report, of which the obvious answer is therefore, as George has already said, and I think John is saying as well, is not only to get your perspective through a Westminster view of Brussels, but to have specialists, and the BBC does have specialists. And there have been a couple of, let me just talk about the BBC particularly for just a second, there have been a couple of goes at this in which the governors, BBC governors as they used to be, it's the BBC Trust now, they perform much the same role, have uh, looked at the BBC's European coverage. Back in 2005 the governors commissioned a report, I paraphrase, these are my words not theirs, but I think the important thing that that report showed is that just because both sides think you're wrong doesn't mean you're right. There was a laziness. Would you believe my battery's now died when I'm trying to find out why? <laughs> but there's a laziness. Someone else can do it. There's a laziness about uh, thinking um, that because the pro-Europeans, in inverted commas, and the Eurosceptics both criticise, you must be getting it right, not true. It is quite possible that both groups have got a point. 
And I think the crucial insight that that work in 2005 did was to make that broad point and to say that both the pro-Europeans who had worries about the coverage of uh, Brussels institutions in European politics and those people who were deeply sceptical and had, their doubts, had a point and the BBC's solution, if you like, was an institutional one, was to create a Europe editor, somebody of status, someone who uh, was there to perform the same sort of role as a politics or an economics editor to specialise in Brussels. And don't underestimate what a big change that was. Up until then, although honourably various holders of the uh, previous Europe correspondents had done it in a different way, but the sort of assumption was Brussels was a place you lived before travelling to other places to report stories. So you happen to be in Brussels and then you pop over to the earthquake in Italy or the train crash in Germany or the bomb here and maybe the old election. I think you know, a fair-minded person would say that since the creation of that Europe editor role, first uh, in Mark Marbell and then in Gavin Hewitt, that coverage has been transformed. There is just much more detailed day-to-day -day coverage, both of the Brussels institutions and of European politics more generally, because they see it as a core part of their job. Now, th that was the big report I mentioned in 2005. There was one then this year, more recently, the so-called Preble, Stuart Preble Review, done by the BBC Trust into impartiality, which found two important things in the audience research, which is, in the audience research element, it found people hear their own views on Europe reflected back. Now, among some Europe specialists, they regard that as a weakness. Why are you playing back to people? I, this is their view, not mine their prejudices, some say. And I think it's to completely misunderstand part of the BBC's responsibility. When you examine why people think, if they do, that the BBC is getting it wrong or is biased, it, it crudely boils down to this. I don't hear people who think like I do. That, that's what the market research shows. I simply don't hear voices. It applies on immigration, it applies on gay rights, and all sorts of issues on which this, over history, over time, has occasionally been reflected. And what this recent report, the Preble report, said, nobody can make that criticism. You do hear voices across the spectrum uh, who think like I do, in inverted commas. And the other thing that this Preble report found is, it's there if you want to find it. The criticism that hasn't yet been made, but let me anticipate it, is, why don't you, um, why don't you cover it in more detail, Europe per Europe, rather than through Westminster? To which my uh, provocative, in the hope of uh, uh, getting a few questions and uh, getting the debate going, is we're not a blooming civics class. You know, it is not the job of news to do Professor Annan's job. You know, that's what he's here for, to study that. It isn't our job to say, you know what, you, you're probably interested in the balance of powers between the Parliament and the Commission and the Council of Ministers, because there are two reasons. You're probably not interested in the balance of powers. In fact, you're certainly not, if, unless you're a freak. And, um, or people like us, and we are freaks because we're paid to be interested in such things or we're passionate about it. Uh, it's not our job to do that per news. Yes, we have documentaries. Yes, we have the analysis program. Yes, we have Gavin Hewitt's Europe blog. We have all sorts of probes. Yes, we have a Democracy Live website where you can watch the European Parliament streamed live. We have lots of places that the BBC can help you kind of find that information, but no, it isn't the job of news unless it's relevant to that news story, unless it's highly pertinent to that particular news story. Um, and um, uh, I, I, I end with one just last thought, which is the big warning I take uh, about the BBC and impartiality, which Anne Andres in terms of the referendum coming up, is that we should beware conventional wisdom. I, I read a book recently which was exploring the relationship between broadcasters and politicians and the lesson way back to Churchill uh, warning of appeasement in the 1930s was that he was effectively silenced because he was outside the conventional wisdom and at the time the BBC had a much narrower definition of impartiality than it has now which was simply you know go to the two front benches and ask them who they want to be their spokespeople and sure enough, at that time, nobody wanted to argue against appeasement. So Churchill was effectively silenced in the 1930s. And it is a huge mistake uh, uh, whether we're talking about Britain should inevitably join the single currency, or indeed now, the, it's unthinkable that Britain would ever join the single currency, to say, well, kind of everybody thinks that. 
or everybody sensible thinks that, or all academics think it, or all economists think it, or all mainstream politicians think it. Not good enough for a definition of impartiality. Not our job. It was thinkable that we didn't join the single currency when the debate was had, and I think the BBC has been self-critical about that. We should have heard those views more prominently at the time. We should have had that debate more prominently than perhaps we did. But it is equally true now that it's perfectly thinkable one day that we might join the single currency. And it's not mad in inverted commas to think it may be a, 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 an uncommon view at the moment, but we should hear those views. So it is not, um, a, 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 just to conclude, the BBC's job either to be a, a civics class uh, through its news or indeed to define what acceptable views are and then do our best to educate everybody else about why they're right. Sorry, not what the licence fee is for. I'll just say a couple of things about me first of all. Um, I've been uh, based out in Brussels for um, over 10 years. I'm a resident in Belgium. I pay my taxes there. I'm not resident or domiciled um, in the UK. I'm a general reporter, so I don't just do political reporting on the European Union. I'll report on train crashes, um, euthanasia, whatever's happening in either Belgium um, or the Netherlands. Um, so I just wanted that to, as a bit of background. Um, one of the things that I find that's a real problem um, about this discussion, I'm very profoundly, as a journalist, I'm profoundly uninterested in discussions um, about journalism. I really uh, cannot stand and, uh, talking about journalism. But journalists talking about what they do and, and why they do it in the way that they do it can be uh, quite interesting. So I thought I'd just talk a, maybe a little bit about why um, I report on the EU in the way that I do and my kind of, some of my sort of starting points because I think they're, they're rather different from, from some of this discussion and I find a lot of the discussion about how the EU uh, is covered as, as, as being sort of defined by being sanctimonious on, on, on one hand you know, aren't we, aren't we grand because we love the EU and all its work and sneering because of course there are all those dumb expressions <coughs> uh, plebs out there who, who just um, who just don't get it. And I think it's very important to, to, to interrogate um, that um, a little bit. The EU is quite unusual for a set of um, political um, institutions. Political institutions um, tend to be rather imperfect. Um, political institutions made by um, civil servants um, and diplomats um, tend to be very unidealistic, quite cynical, um, very practical, um, and often making a virtue um, out of um, something that is almost um, dull. But yet these institutions have these this sort of crazy, incredible sort of uh, mystique and claims made for them. I mean, you, will talk to, you could talk to people um, around the EU and, and, and its supporters who will claim um, that it's a peace project for the EU, these institutions in Brussels, um, and the sort of some of the bizarre practices that surround them are all that stand uh, between um, us, European societies, um, and another uh, world war, um, and we, we all know what happened um, in the last one. I think that's a, an incredible, uh, quite incredible um, conceit, and I, and, I, and, I, and I give it as an example to show that the, the EU sort of tracks these strange, uh, these sort of um, strange claims, and, and as others have pointed out, there are some people who think that Britain um, is, is, is run um, by the EU when in fact of course um, the EU or Brussels is in many ways as British um, as, as Whitehall. Um, the other problem with the debate is if you're critical of the EU or if you're pretty anti the EU as I am, um, then somehow you're anti-European. This idea that in this very narrow um, and rather limited um, set of institutions as in terms of their scope and, and what they do and certainly um, in terms of um, their history. But somehow the idea that that's being European, all of that history, all that philosophy, Kant, Hegel, and all the rest of it, all that culture is somehow embodied um, in these institutions um, in Brussels. And I find that a very odd uh, discussion to me, the, to, to have a discussion about what it means to be European um, and the institutions of the Union to completely, uh, completely 
uh, completely different things. And the idea that somehow the European Union um, is the end of history, that this, we've arrived, that this is the, the sort of the, the Europe, I, I find again uh, uh, to be a, a fairly unbearable uh, conceit. Um, the other thing that you, you have to sort of throw away when people are talking about the EU, particularly experts, is how complicated it is. The EU isn't complicated, it's a way, um, it's a set of institutions uh, that take um, political um, decisions. That's not complicated, but what, what can be quite difficult is finding out what decisions have been taken and what the alternatives were um, on the table. Beware of anybody who tells you that something like the economy or politics is so complicated um, that nobody can understand it. I mean, that's part of the problem with the EU is it is a political, a way of doing politics that is quite mystified. It's a process, and of course there'll be pedants who will say, well, a proposal's not a decision, and, you know, who knows when the decision's been taken? Has it been taken uh, when it's voted in a plenary in the European Parliament? Has it been voted when it's been transcribed into uh, 20, 28 uh, member states? Has it been taken when the Commission do a review of it to check that it's been implemented properly? I'll tell you what, according to the EU, a decision is never really taken. There's never an ideal moment to talk about what the EU has done uh, or wants to do. And that's, again, the, a, a decision that mystifies um, and obscures. And I, I really see it as the job of uh, being a journalist and actually being a member of the public um, is to try and cut through, uh, cut through all of that kind of thing. Now, I've been in Brussels uh, a long time. I love living in Brussels. I love living... Um, abroad, you're welcome to uh, living in Britain. Um, it's really good. Um, I'm kind of a, a European sort of guy in many ways. Um, but in Brussels, I am regarded um, as the enemy in many respects, and I don't mind that at all. Um, and part of that sort of indigestible quality is the adversarial um, stance. I mean, George talks about the French journalist. Um, I remember, yeah, I mean, you, I mean I've been hissed at, in, uh, hissed at in, in, in press briefings and called a dirty populist um, by, by my journalistic colleagues. I'll never forget when uh, Barroso moved the press back into the Berlin Mall um, back in 2004 um, and uh, the press was segregated um, from the commission officials and can, you can no longer wander into you know, Neil Kinnock's office for a chat or, or anything like that. It was just, you know, it was a bit of a pity. And I'll never forget the, the head of an extremely pompous journalistic um, organisation over there called AFI standing up and protesting because the journalists were being treated um, like ordinary members of the public. And that's part of the problem I have sometimes with some of these rather grand um, journalists because they're, the, they're part of the club, part of the experts, part of this very mystified and obscurantist uh, uh, kind of uh, politics. So... I think it's very important when writing about the EU or, or in fact, any other um, institution. Um, and British institutions are not um, exempt for that. All the conduct of politics. I think it's very important to assume that they're not necessarily representative of the public or of um, the public interest. And one of the, fa the things I find fascinating about the European mystique is it sort of floats off from us. It sort of floats off from reality and becomes like a holy grail, it's European, you can't criticise, it's European, it's peace, man, it's, you know, not going to war. So, I don't think if you assume that the EU is necessarily representative of the European spirit, of European history, of peace project, um, that you're actually being um, very um, objective. 60% of the, you know, the last uh, Eurobarometer, like the EU's last polling, and it's very sort of, a, it's a lot, I mean, they've got a lot of money, so they spend a lot of money on their polling, so it's good polling done by Gallup, shows that 60% of Europeans across the EU, 27 at that time, mistrust the European uh, institutions, it's 68% um, in the UK. Now, I'm not going to make a big thing out of that, except to say that it is pretty clear, particularly at the moment, right across Europe, that the EU are a set of institutions are not widely seen as representative. Um, and I think that's a very, very important starting point. I know it's very difficult uh, for some people to, to um, understand or like. One of the things that's absolutely true about the EU, particularly in Britain, but also in other countries um, as well, I think the debate in Germany has always been quite sharp-edged and it's particularly uh, so at the moment, certainly in, in the Netherlands, is the way in which the EU has become a sort of cipher 
um, a symbol, the meaning of the EU, and the meaning of institutions is, is very important, has become a, a cipher or a symbol for out-of-touch government, out-of-touch administration that's miles away from you. It's literally foreign. It's this sort of alien, uh, this alien kind of quality. And if you look at, say, in Britain, when the European Union or when Britain joined the, economic, the European Economic Community, that was in a period where the political consensus in Britain had broken. The post-war consensus had broken. There was actually quite a lot of political turmoil, quite a lot of political struggle. And when Britain came through that, at the end of the 80s, this new way of ruling, this new administration, wasn't necessarily uh, a sort of happy, uh, a happy bargain or, or, or a happy, um, a, a happy uh, process. People felt in Britain throughout the 80s into the 90s quite estranged from many aspects um, of government. And the government uh, in Britain too became to be seen as being uh, rather remote. So I think that's part of the objective world um, in which we live in. And I, I, I would be very suspicious uh, of a journalist who tried to go against that objectivity, tried to go against the mistrust um, that people have of institutions that don't necessarily uh, represent them. I, I would be, I would, I would, I'd be um, quite, uh, I'd be quite uneasy um, if journalists were to do that, because whilst the EU might be obscure, whilst in, in, in terms of the way it takes its decisions, whilst the EU outside the European Parliament um, operates behind closed doors, uh, quite often in secret, quite often decisions are a fait accompli, written in this amazingly dead, diplomatic, bureaucratic language of some conclusions. Behind that, there are still um, competing truths. There are decisions that are taken, there were alternatives to them, perhaps um, the EU doesn't always take uh, the right decision, and if anyone doesn't believe that, um, just go and read the coverage of the Eurozone um, crisis. Now, that presents a real challenge for, for journalists. Now, I'm not a lobby journalist, so when I do a summit, I don't uh, go to Cameron or Brown or Blair briefing, I go to Merkel um, or I go to uh, Hollande or, or, or Sarkozy um, in the past. And I think it's very, very true to say it's not only British Prime Ministers who do the battling uh, Brussels routine, they all do it. Um, they have different variants. Uh, they have different variants of it. In fact, in May 2010, when they agreed to bail out um, Greece, Merkel was so angry and so humiliated she didn't even do a press conference. She just flounced, uh, flounced out of the site. So it's not, a, it's not a uniquely British Prime Minister thing. It's not this sort of sneering at our political parties and their tribalism um, and their sort of conflictual um, idea of politics. All, 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 um, all people do it. And there is a real problem at summits because we don't know what's going on. They're sitting in a little conclave um, the delegations, the officials that are working with them, the ambassadors and their advisors um, are a little, uh, a little conclave and the whole arrangement is rigged to make it very, very difficult um, to know uh, what is going on um, the summit conclusions are not necessarily um, representative of the political discussions that took place there because they're written in a sort of dead uh, consensual language that's deliberately uh, meant to have as many meanings sometimes as leaders were um, sitting um, around the table. So, for example, when we talk about this famous veto uh, uh, summit in 2000, December 2011, the real significance of that summit was the EU was unable uh, to do things by the usual methods, which told you something about the tensions that were operating between EU member states, particularly um, uh, in the big three um, in terms of the Eurozone crisis. David Cameron's demands that everyone's talking about, they weren't made public. That was a restricted document. Uh, the Telegraph made them um, public. Um, not the government, not anyone else um, at that summit. So that's again part of what journalists are trying to do. We're trying to crack open the door. You know, they tell us that they're having these important discussions and they come down and hand us down these summit conclusions. But our job is to try and crack open the doors and find out what they're actually uh, talking about. As an aside, what's very interesting about that list of demands that Cameron made, if he'd have got those demands, he really would have been in trouble. Because he would have come back to the House of Commons and he would have told uh, Eurosceptic MPs that he'd saved the City of London, that really popular 
uh, group of people who all read uh, the SP. Um, he hadn't repatriated any powers. He just, you know, uh, made life easier uh, for the treasuries. Uh, he would have made life easier for the uh, treasuries relationship uh, for bankers. So, one of the jobs you have as a journalist in Brussels is to try and go against the grain of how all these institutions work, to try and find out what's going on. They talk about amazingly sensitive. Stuff. I mean, Greece, what's been going on in Greece and the Eurozone, the sovereignty of nations, how they dispose of their national wealth, decided in little cabals uh, of diplomats or leaders in Brussels. Prime ministers, we know prime ministers have been defenestrated from Papandreou uh, to Berlusconi. There's lots of stuff now coming out in Italy about how they pulled the plug, as the term was used, um, on, Berlusconi, uh, on Berlusconi. We know that they have discussions about not holding referendums, and that's Cameron's real crime. Uh, in Brussels, it isn't, it isn't to talk about repatriating powers from the treaty, everyone does that. The you know, banal British position that he's actually offered a referendum and that's seen as unforgivable because the OIT could decide. It takes it out of the conclave, it takes it out of the very, very complicated procedures that only a real, uh, rather grand um, expert um, can pronounce on, uh, uh, pronounce upon, and, and let uh, the people decide, and, and, and I'll just finish on this. I mean, you always know, you always know when the EU reporting debate uh, becomes a big one that, the, the, that possibly the debate is coming a bit closer to where it really should belong um, with the voters. And the reason why um, the sort of grandees and these terribly important people who are terribly important because they understand um, this incredibly uh, complicated. Uh, uh, a process um, and they're, they're sort of initiated into the, the cult of its holiness and its piety it's above war and, and all this political strife floating up, up the, over there it's, it's European you always know that this debate is coming up because it's coming down to politics real dirty politics where people start to decide because one of the things that all the people who love the EU are very very self-conscious about they, they, they know that most people don't share that loyalty. They know that most people, I just gave you your overall figures across Europe, don't share, um, don't share that love of these institutions, they don't share that love of a way um, of conducting um, politics. So I'd be very careful, I mean, yeah, that's a discussion about how rubbish the Daily Mail is and you know, even how rubbish the Daily Telegraph is and how irresponsible you know, Bruno Waterfield or someone else has been um, with, a, a, with a particular uh, mm -hmm. with a particular report, but you know, let's not forget um, at, at the end of the day that, the, that quite often this is a very sneering debate about the capacities of people to make up their own minds um, on this. And that's what really offends the, 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 the people who get really upset about um, EU reporting is the fact that people read it. <laughs> Thank you very much indeed. Okay, we have Hello. My name is John Preston of the European Movement. Um, my question to you folk from the media is that there are two elections which you really enjoy reporting. One of them is the election of the President of the United States of America and the other is the corresponding election which elects the Prime Minister of India. These are two federal events and they're federal because they're democratic but because at the end of the day they produce somebody who is clearly identified with a policy for the country of which they have responsibility. How do you the media relish the idea of a similar election taking place in Europe? John Danzig, you haven't really answered the question I came here to be answered. Uh, why, what is the excuse for inaccurate reporting of the European Union? I can understand that different shades of politics, that there will be some pro and some against that I can respect. But a doctor collecting test results, for example, will want accurate results before coming to an opinion. 
and I feel a lot of the newspapers, of which probably most in this country are against the European Union, are not reporting accurately. Why is that? Do you have an example? Uh, well, for example, the, uh, when, when we hear about the European Convention on Human Rights, it's often mixed up with being a uh, European Union, when it's not anything to do with the European Union. But actually there is a, a website run by the European Union on a whole list of uh, press reports which are inaccurate. Um, and they're really very badly reported. And how can you account for that? I guess it's on the same lines, but um, it's almost like it only the bad things are reported. And we're not hearing the, the pro-Europe side, and I'm sure there's some people who are pro-European. It's just that um, there is no time allowed for that debate to go on. It's, it's treated almost like a, like a tabloid news sometimes, it feels like, um, rather than a, than a serious debate. Um, and I'm shocked, traveling from different countries in, within Europe, that in this time and age, when there is internet, there is direct access 24 hours to different press, uh, different newspapers around Europe, how can two institutions such as, let's say, BBC and the Spanish television come out of the same meeting and feed us such completely different stories? And if you happen to travel on the same day, which I did during the um, Brown uh, Treaty and, and recently Cameron, it's actually quite comic, buying the paper in Madrid in the morning and then getting the paper here in the evening. And I just cannot understand, when we all have access to it, how, how we don't say anything. <laughs> right, we want to ask? We don't do anything at all, do we? Yes, I mean, thanks, Keith, for, for being um, uh, wrong. People shouldn't um, do it, and um, people shouldn't make things up. Most of them that I've known, I've made some chances, um, made some chances, um, don't really, you know, go out of the way to, to make things up. You all omit um, institutional website. Uh, you, you talk about it quite interesting. It's, a lot of it's interpreted, and so a lot of it's sort of it's angels dancing on the head of a pin. Was it the EU who proposed it, or was it Comitology, which meant it was a delegated committee uh, of industry and all that, all of that? Uh, kind of stuff. Very few of those stories are actually <laughs> completely um, made up. I think the different stories is really interesting because it, it's not necessarily that the British media are really horrible. It's the fact that there are actually different national uh, interests at play here so people have a different takeaway um, from a summit. I think one of the problems with the pro-European side is there are certain types of people. I mean, it's sort of bankers and big business, sort of dreadful old sort of never retired politicians in the House of Lords, um, sort of top cops whose idea of being pro-European in the Times the other day was to warn about bunches of thieving Romanian gittos on Easter. Right, so I think part of the problem with the pro-European arguments is it's, it's a very limited, uh, it's a very limited narrative perhaps because it's all about a bunch of very limited institutions. Uh, well, yes, just a couple of, couple of points. I mean, on, on this question of, of why are we more interested in, in the election of Barack Obama than, than the choice of Herman Van Rompuy, um, <coughs> I mean, I think it is because the US president is, is, is it's a big elected job and he has, a, he has, he has power. And, and I don't think the choice of the next commission president will ever generate that sort of interest. Um, and I actually have strong reservations myself about the idea of hijacking the European elections and turning them into a way of choosing the European Commission President. I mean, it is sort of emerging rather slowly, but I don't think it's actually going to improve the way Europe is run, and I don't think it's necessarily going to improve the way the press reports about it. Um, you know, we are actually a, a collection of member, of member states. We're not, in fact, a federal United States of Europe, even if we move slowly in that direction. Um, but, but <coughs> what I really wanted to say was this point about different stories and inaccurate reporting. I mean, yeah, we can't really answer that question, but I did offer one version of it, which is I do think the ownership of the media matters. Um, and um, if you work for the Daily Express, which I never have done, but if you did work for the Daily Express, I think you are expected to find stories about <coughs> Brussels, diktats, um, you know, banning um, lawn mowing or whatever it happens to be. Um, because that's what the owner of the Daily Express wants you to report. 
Um, I'm not sure as much we can do about it, but I do think that the Commission has got slightly better at rebutting, at rebutting stories, partly through, through, through this, this website. And the, the question about why everything is, is reported so differently in Italy, Spain, well, I did, I did touch on it, and so did Nick Robinson. I mean, I, I think there is a tendency that is definitely not unique to Britain. There is a tendency for all governments to say anything that's good in Europe was something done by national governments. And anything that's slightly bad, um, you know, in position of austerity, has been done by Brussels. And everybody does the same thing. Um, and a consequence of that is that, is that <coughs> reporting, particularly at summits, is bound to be set up on the basis of, you know, Rajoy achieved the triumph. Um, uh, and, and it's going to be different from the story that's appearing elsewhere. And I guess the answer, if there is an answer, is that reporters, including, as, as Bruno said, reporters um, in Brussels, should try and get the story from the other countries as well and try to reflect that when, when the reports are done. But it's, as Nick said, it's quite difficult to do that if you've been given conclusions and you have to go on air in three minutes. Time. <coughs> you, uh, you, could, you could do better later. Um, just, just picking up that, uh, that thought, I mean, I think it does go to one thing that Bruno Waterfeld said. I mean, it's the only bit of reporting I do. I can't hear them, I can't see them, and I can't read anything they do, and I'm expected to report what happens between 27 leaders in a room. I am, I am dependent on, therefore, quite often third-hand accounts. Either first-hand accounts heavily spun by whoever a, a national leader is, or third-hand accounts from people I, I sit, find more reliable, but they are dependent on what the... I mean, at a summit, just, just let's be literal about how this happens. The Prime Minister is often on his own in those meetings. So there is a several-hour delay between the Prime Minister telling his advisers exactly what happened and them having the capacity to then tell their press people who tell are more likely to feed that stuff to us. Now, the better journalist you are, you may have a direct link to the official rather than to the press spokesman. But there's a limit to their capacity to talk to you. And what you certainly don't have is first-hand information for yourself, which I do in all other stories I report. I can watch and see and read it for, my, for myself. So what I've tried to do over the years is you try to get cameo about why you're being told what you're told. You do try to rely on your colleagues, so at the BBC, we go out of our way at summits, and that included the veto summit, to try and have me report it from the perspective of the visiting British, British delegation and a Europe editor or one of our Europe correspondents say this is how it seems you know, to other countries here. And we deliberately try to kind of say there's more than one way of, of looking at that. Uh, I, I didn't get a chance to say my battery died, but my, my memory of the famous Cameron veto was that we did report that summit uh, what Cameron said about it because he called us in at about half past three in the morning I was got out of bed, I had five minutes notice to get dressed, uh, to go and hear David Cameron saying I vetoed it but my very strong memory is, I may be wrong and uh, it's always dangerous in seminar to do this, but I did make clear on that morning that this was not the result he had set out to achieve, that this was a brave face put on failure rather than a success I am almost certain that I said that uh, that morning, but obviously I don't have the source document in front of me to judge, so in a sense, I didn't at 3.30 in the morning have much chance to speak to other delegations, but our Euro correspondents did, it was a developing story, we tried to make it clearer uh, as time moved on. Um, not hearing the pro-European side is something I frankly I just don't recognise. I mean, I think um, Ken Clark, Peter Mandelson, uh, um, I, you know, frankly, if you're anti-European, every government in recent history has been the pro-European side, and they get hurt. So if you really think that Europe is a bad thing, every single minister that has spoken on the subject of Europe is a pro-European, if you're Nigel Farage. So <laughs> I just think you cannot say, yeah, yeah, but hold on, what, why do you get to define what's... Do you know what I mean? I mean, it's in the eye of the beholder. That, yeah, sure, but that, 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 that matters. Uh, because they pay the licence fee too, you know? And uh, with the BBC, our job is to reflect the views of people like the gentleman from the European movement who, I don't know if it's your uh, view, sir, that you would like a pan-European directly elected president, but there are plenty of people who do think that. Uh, it may or may not be your view. And there are people who think we should leave the EU. They are all licence fee payers and we've got to find a way of representing uh, or at least reflecting some of their views.
Um, Nick Clegg will give a major speech on a pro-European speech tomorrow. Uh, where it'll be in news running orders, who can tell? I don't know what else is on, but I'd be surprised if it wasn't covered. So I just don't recognise the thought that pro-European voices are not heard other than for this reason, which is all the parties are now running scared of the mood of the electorate that Bruno Waterfeld described. All parties have thought, my God, we got this wrong. We're in the wrong place with regard to the electorate. So it is certainly true that whether it's Nick Clegg, the most pro-European political leader probably, uh, of all, well, certainly of all, even he, up until his speech tomorrow, has toned down a lot of his views on Europe and not highlighted them and not given speeches or interviews about them because you know, his pollsters are telling him that they would be deeply unpopular if he did. And it's not our job to go and dig them out if they don't want to say it. Uh, uh, the, the, the thing that makes me most uncomfortable about this debate is something in a sense that, if you'll forgive me, you know, you said and Bruno said from, as it were, opposite wings. You know, it's not about sides, it's about bloody news. You know, what, Bruno, I actually do follow his reporting, I think it's very good, I admire him for wanting, as he puts it, to crack it open. But the moment my flesh kind of goes is when he says, uh, it's our job to go against the grain, it's not to bloody well report it. That is our job, is to report it. And the truth is, there are newspapers who either in Bruno's case and the Telegraph think it's their job to be opposed to Europe or in other papers who think it's their job to be in favour of Europe. And the BBC finds itself in a very difficult position where we're constantly asked, well, come on, take sides. Why aren't you on his side or their side? And we are trying to find a way of not being on any side. Now, don't get me wrong, we quite often don't get it perfect. You know, we really, really don't. But I'm deeply uncomfortable with the, the notion that ever since, you know, Ted Heath in 1971, if not before, it's the job of journalists to take a side on whether Britain should be in or out, or in the current, or out of the current, have a referendum, or not have a referendum. You don't know. That's not what we're paid for. I can kind of say that as well, just, on, just very quickly on that. Um, I agree with what Nick said there, that some of the main, main my as a special bit when, when Bruno said he is anti-European Union, but he also said that the European Union is basically a set of political institutions which, which make political decisions. And as Nick says, why do we need to be pro-EU or anti-EU? We are reporting, or we should be reporting, from my point of view, factually, a set of decisions being taken in Brussels. And one thing just on the whole question about different sides and getting different, totally different... Sure, sure. The, the what? One of the things, because I think lots of people have said that actually reporting the European Union is quite difficult because it's, meetings happen behind closed doors and you, know, you can't see what's actually happening. That's certainly true. But the thing I found most fascinating about working in Brussels was the fact that although the EU on the face of it is a secret organisation, in practice it's the most open organisation that there is because if you've worked in Brussels and you've got contacts who work for the Commission, in the Council, people who are in the room, you've got the British obviously briefing you, go and get a different source from the French, go and speak to the Germans, Best of all, go and speak to the Nordics, who uh, are certainly among the best European diplomats who know what's going on and will tell you because they believe in openness. You speak to five or six people, get a build, build of, sort of 24, a sort of 360 degree view of what's been going on in the room. You can cut through all the bullshit, basically, that the British Prime Minister, or in the case of Gordon Brown in particular, was spouting, and often come up with some rather good stories. I mean, Gordon Brown was, uh, he was legendary for um, briefing the British press, and the lecture he was about to deliver to. European colleagues about how rubbish they were and the, the superiority of the British model of financial capitalism. This was before 2008, by the way. Um, and the, you could, you, quite often, you wouldn't actually even bother to attend the meeting. And so you then have a good alternative story, which is Gordon Brown tells to show up at a meeting. You know. So it, it is entirely possible to, to report it if you invest the time in building contacts uh, and indeed if you have reporters in, like we know in Brussels. Right, we've got five people waiting, and if you will all agree to be quick, we might choose the order of the gentleman at the back, the gentleman next to him, a lady at the top there, sort of the gentleman in the middle, and a very young man in the middle at the back. Okay, um, David Bowden from the Battle of Ideas Festival. I just, I always find it interesting when this sort of discussion in a way seems to miss the kind of elephant in the room about whether it's, you know, the express reporting on bananas, which is the problem at the heart of Europe. The problem at the heart of Europe seems to be pretty obvious, which is that it attempted to grant itself, you know, democratic legitimacy with the European constitution, uh, to, you know, try and really kind of build a sort of sense of itself with a, as an institution with a sort of clear purpose and a clear mandate. And it failed at the first hurdle. Uh, with the European Constitution, then have to spend the next five years trying to navigate the people of Europe to try and push through this mandate and essentially got to the point where the entirety of 
Brussels was obsessing over the Irish to see how they vote because they were the only people they couldn't get around putting the vote to. So isn't that really, when we're talking about the problems of reporting within Europe, we're essentially shooting the messengers here, that actually there is a big, deep political pr problem at the heart of Europe, which so far the, you know, the political elites, the pro-Europeans, have not so far worked out how to solve. And we are essentially just you know, ha having a go at journalists for not successfully selling the project to people, when in reality that's not their job. Um, Peter Smith, Member of the Public. Um, I'm a little bit concerned when we hear things about editorial lines of newspapers being anti-European or, or even pro-European, newspapers running populist stories, proprietors whose views dominate uh, editorial lines fitting, fitting in with proprietors and countries running stories about how isolated they are. Because isn't that just a cut and thrust of politics? Um, and for me, that is the political life. And the way that, that we sort of suggest that that is a problem is avoiding the fact of, of politics and the cut and thrust of that. And the bigger question, I suppose, with, with that politics in mind is, is the European Union at the moment just a hard sell? You know, go and speak to you know, young Spanish people, young French people, Greeks. Um, it's a hard sell. Um, so I'm, I'm a little bit concerned that the, the idea of politics seems to be um, being diminished. Newspaper owners own things and tell people how to write editorials. That's politics, that's life. Um, Pro-Europeans should be bigger and get on with it, but they seem to cry about it too much. <laughs> um, my name's Lucy Anderson. I'm a Labour candidate for the, uh, at the European Parliament in London. And so this is extremely fascinating, this whole discussion for me. Um, and I'm pleased to say that Londoners certainly tend to be far more appreciative and understanding of the concrete benefits that being in the European Union brings than other people in the country, particularly where it's environmental standards, trade benefits, free movement, London as a world city. People get that and they understand it. But I mean, I think what Bruno said is completely the main point, is that the, the heart of Europe is incredibly undemocratic. And a lot of the things that have been done in the name of the European Union don't have a legal base. I mean, I'm a lawyer by trade. Don't have a legal base, really, when it comes to it, what was done to Cyprus, what was done in Greece. And that's making Europe, Europe, Europe's institutions more transparent is the big thing there. And I was really pretty astonished that in your opening uh, remarks, nobody specifically mentioned the European elections. We're eight months away. Yes, there is a democratic deficit. Yes, the Parliament could explain more what it does. But ultimately, it is the largest elected institution in the world, and it has very significant powers. And Nick, in terms of civics, no one's asking you to do civics. But there are so many key stories that simply don't get a look in at all. My colleague, Claude Moraes, is currently leading a European Parliament inquiry on um, the, the snooping, the CIA snooping, allegedly, that's been going on. And there are lots of people who are extremely interested in that, but that, and that's being reported in other European countries, but for some reason it's getting very little coverage here, let alone all the concrete legislation that, that again, doesn't get a look in. Thanks very much. Peter Wilding, Director of British Influence, which is a pro-membership uh, campaign group. Um, I just want to ask this question, actually. The uh, title of the event today is Reporting Europe, Not Reporting Brussels. And so I just want to ask whether this panel actually believes, number one, does the reporting of uh, British policy in the EU have any adverse effect at all on the British capacity to actually get its own ends in the EU and in bilateral relations? Because my impression is they all think we're Nigel Farage and we all vote for UKIP. And that's the problem. So the question number one is, does this reportage have an adverse effect on how the Brits want to seek to achieve their objectives? Um, and secondly, I'll give you a story. This is not just about Brussels. This is about, as George and John were saying, the real fascinating thing that's going on is that it's the Parliament and the Commission are just a bagatelle. The real runners of Europe, London, Paris, Berlin. I mean, what's going on in the capitals of these countries is fascinating. And one little fact, I bet you didn't know that the Prime Minister has 18 member states supporting his reform agenda, which is going to come up at the October Council. For all the reportage that we hear about, it's 27 versus 1. And that may be his problem, but it's also our problem in the reporting of it too.
Thank you, Chairman. My name is Paul Adamson, founder of eSharp Magazine. Um, I actually sympathize you, with you, Bruno. You'll be surprised to hear me say that. When you said at the beginning that, uh, that you talked about the superiority of some of the kind of extreme pro-European and their kind of sneering attitude, I just wonder whether you feel that, um, are, are they getting the picture back in Brussels, since you're still in Brussels, unlike the other panelists, in the sense that they are realizing there are different ways to be pro-European without necessarily being an arch federalist? Maybe not a Bruno Waterfield person, but maybe. I know that John and uh, George, when they were in Brussels, they kind of suffer from not being totally true believers. Uh, that's, that's point one. Point two, do any of the panel think that those people who are paid to promote Europe, uh, in the institution in particular, but elsewhere, uh, overstate it when they say that we can't do much because the, the media are against us? Is that too convenient to kind of weigh, not to be more effective? And question three is, um, um, with all respect to the panel, are we overstating the role of the print media because of the way and some of the people in this room, not me obviously, are quite young and don't maybe read newspapers very much these days and use other sorts of media for their information and therefore maybe we overstate or over focus on the, the power of the print media. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we'll, we'll go the um, yes, take, take up the points at the back there about Europe being a hard sell and the failed European constitution. Yeah, absolutely. But I don't think anyone could say that the, the media have not reported this or trials and tribulations of trying to get the constitution onto the statute book in 27 or 28 countries now. Um, we did cover it, but in a sense that's not our job. It's, I mean, it's, it's, the thing that gets me about this whole debate is we're not trying, as journalists, as Nick, very much Nick's point, this is a news story. We're not here as propagandists. We shouldn't be at least here as propagandists. The way that the, some of the uh, Express, the Sun, Mail, cover it, Europe, is not that they're necessarily inaccurate, it's just the reporting is so slanted. Um, and it just seems to me, I don't, I, you know, as Paul was saying, I, I wasn't a true believer in Brussels, uh, and I had a fairly hard time when I was out there, but I still think we have a duty to look at it in a fairly open-minded way and report the facts, rather than pretending we're running some sort of um, propaganda sheet. Um, European Parliament elections, the truth is, and going back to the question from the European movement as well, we all know that the European Parliament elections will be about national issues. They always are. No matter what uh, we try to do to make them more interesting, or the European Union tries to do to make them more interesting. It's very hard to sell. The European Parliament doesn't help itself. I think it's, it's literally a democratic outrage that um, the European Parliament continues to meet in Strasbourg, and until the European Parliament sorts that out, I don't think it deserves to be taken seriously as an institution. And anybody which has two homes and requires journalists, not basically, they, it's, a, it's an institution which escapes without any democratic scrutiny whatsoever because journalists a news organisation that simply cannot afford to send reporters to cover what's happening. That may be one reason why Corberator's initiative is not covered by, by the press. Um, and the question there about whether the way that the UK media covers the European Union, whether it has an impact on British foreign policy and our ability to shape the European debate, I'd say the answer is definitely yes to that. Um, one of the, I was speaking to someone in Downing Street the other day who had a very pertinent point, I thought, which was, we don't read their papers because they're written in foreign languages, but they do read ours because they speak English. And the fact is that the British view of the European Union uh, is reflected through our media to 27 other national capitals. They have a distorted view, not just of the way the British public view the European Union, as you were suggesting, there's a view that we're all uh, UKIP supporters here, but also, more importantly, I think, they get a totally distorted view of how important Europe is as an issue for members of the public. You would think if you read some sections of the British press that the European Union was the most important thing in people's lives rather than something which regularly features about 17 or 18 in the list of top 20 issues you care about. And I think that's a dangerous thing. Um, and it does have an impact on our foreign policy, and I think it's uh, regrettable. Thank you. Sure. Um, yes, well, well briefly. Um, democratic legitimacy, yes, I think that's a massive issue. Um, uh, we actually, as an economist, do try and report it, and we don't always only report the news. Uh, most of what we write is comment as well, but we're perhaps, perhaps rather unusual. Um, but I think it's perfectly fair to say um, there's been a democratic legitimacy problem for a long time. The rejection of the constitutional treaty followed by its enactment by the back door and the overriding in effect of at least three vetoes um, was only part of it. I think the euro crisis has made the democratic legitimacy problem far, far worse. Um, and it is definitely building. I mean, when you have, you know, Belgian senators say, say who elected Olly Rehn, or when you have Francois Hollande, who signed the fiscal compact and all the other paraphernalia that, that go through, but then says it's not the job of the Commission to tell us what to do. Well, unfortunately, he signed various documents saying it is the job of the Commission to tell us what to do. Um, but the question of accountability and legitimacy 
post-Euro crisis is going to be a central one. Sadly, I don't think it's going to be debated at all in the European elections. Um, I agree with what George said about the European elections. Um, they will, I mean, in this country, I expect UKIP to come top. In France, I expect um, the Front National to come top. Um, and insofar as there are any issues, they'll be about the unpopularity of, of the national government, not at all about the future of Europe. But I think there should be a much bigger debate about democratic accountability in, the, in, in Europe. And I think it will, I think it will, um, will grow. <coughs> um, uh, one, uh, one, other, one reason for that, of course, is that, is that an answer to democratic legitimacy and accountability was always, well, don't worry about it too much because Europe delivers results. As long as it's delivering results, you know, cheaper mobile phones, um, better air travel and so on, more people um, free to move around Europe, those are all very good things. And indeed, that's one reason why, in a way, Europe is, a, is, is more popular than the European Union because it, it, it works for young people. But the problem, again, with the Euro crisis is now it's not delivering results. And there's a perception, particularly in the Mediterranean countries, that even in places like France, is that Europe is now bad for for, for, for people and not good for people and th those countries are going to have a, a huge amount of work to do persuade, to persuade people that actually Europe can still be, be good for them. Um, two other things that I, I, would, I would add in, in answer to some of those comments many of which I thought were very pertinent uh, Peter you're absolutely right about national capitals and I think it's very interesting uh, during the Euro crisis that the action has moved increasingly from Brussels uh, inevitably it's moved to one particular capital um, and um, I think from the, po from the point of view of reporting that actually makes our life in some ways more difficult because it has been traditional for obvious reasons that Europe tends to be reported from Brussels but actually if Berlin is a place where, where it matters um, perhaps we should, and, and actually BBC is quite good at this, Gavin Hughes does go to Berlin quite a lot um, perhaps that's what we should, we should be doing more of is making sure that we, we focus on, on events in the Chancellery and not events in the European Commission um, uh, I don't actually think that the I, I slightly disagree with George I, I agree that, that the rest of Europe does know about um, the, the British press and, the, and they think that the British people are, are all going to vote for Farage and indeed in the European elections they probably are I don't actually think that that undermines Britain's ability to get its way in Brussels I think Britain continues to be remarkably effective at getting things done in Brussels um, partly thanks to our diplomats in Brussels um, but it is partly also um, because we often have a good case and as, as I think you, you were saying um, Peter, you know, a lot of other people agree with the Bloomberg speech I mean, I, I was at a platform with Gunter Verheugen two weeks ago, former Social Democrat um, Commissioner from Germany and he rather surprised me by starting his remarks by saying I very strongly agreed with David Cameron's Bloomberg speech he didn't agree with the referendum but he agreed with everything else and so that bit of the agenda, I think, I think is there. And the print, the emphasis, final point, the emphasis on the print media, I, I think that's perfectly fair. We obviously emphasise that because we are print media. Well, he's not print media, but the rest of us are print media, so we like to think we're important. Um, but we are probably increasingly less important than we were. I actually think that the agenda for the broadcast media and possibly the agenda for the online media is still being set to some extent by the print media, but I think that's changing, and the print media is probably going to become less and less relevant. Thanks very much indeed. Um, uh, two broad points, really. The first thing is, though I think it's a perfectly legitimate question to say what impact does your reporting have and so on, there's always a nervousness whenever I've been asked to talk about this from my perspective at the BBC, which is debates about reporting Europe are usually linked to people who say, look, Europe's not popular, so you guys are reporting it wrong. You know, I don't measure my reporting by whether the opinion polls are up or down in terms of pe people's uh, uh, you know, good opinion of Europe. And I do think there are people who do that, who say, uh, and criticise the BBC, and say, well, you know, you're obviously getting it wrong because e the EU's unpopular. That's not my measure of reporting. And I don't think it should be a measure of reporting. I think it would be inaccurate. I, I, my instinct is in Greece and in Spain, the Eurozone crisis has quite a lot more to do with it than the nature of reporting uh, in terms of people's uh, uh, sort of sympathy with what the European project is doing. Um, it seems to me at the heart of the discussion we've been having, trying to kind of draw from it, is that there is a tension, if you like, between two jobs of reporting Europe. There is reporting the institutions as they are and I hear Lucy's frustration about being an MEP candidate. Why don't you tell us what is happening in the Commission or the Parliament or whatever else in, in Europe? The tension between that and the permanent debate about the legitimacy of the EU. 
And the reason that it tends to be the latter, the second part of that, that wins out, is because it has been the defining, or one of the defining issues of politics, of government, in my time reporting. I mean, you know, I have lived through the Labour Party, first of all, being against Europe and wanting to pull out, then changing its mind under Neil Kinnock, uh, then adapting again as to having a struggle as to whether it was pro or anti the single currency between the Prime Minister and the Chancellor. I have in my time lived through Thatcher saying no, 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 and being toppled because of her views on Europe, Major almost being toppled because of his views on the Maastricht Treaty, uh, the tensions, as I say, between Blair and Brown, and now Cameron facing one of the m- biggest tests of all, trying to control those people who either want out or want to renegotiate Uh, Britain's relationship with Europe. So the truth is, Lucy, if this doesn't sound too flippant, it'd have to be a pretty damn good select committee hearing or committee hearing in Brussels or Strasbourg to be more important than that. A fundamental debate about power in our own country uh, and about our future direction. And that's why Claude Moraes' committee, I guess, I don't know the detail of it, really struggles to get on, along with 17 other select committees in the House of Lords and the House of Commons who also want to get on, because it doesn't cut the mustard in news terms compared with the fact that the Prime Minister might lose his majority, or that we might be about to vote in a few years' time to leave our principal foreign policy relationship. These things are just bigger. And until that relationship is, as it were, settled, and let me repeat, not my job to settle it, until that job is settled, it is bound to be the case that the, 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 the micro-reporting of day-to-day goings-on in, in this or that European institution will have to compete with that. It shouldn't always be wiped out. We should try our best. I think our team in Brussels do try very hard to get that uh, material on. And just finally, I think John Pete, though, puts his, his finger on it, which is there was a period where we thought European reporting was Brussels. It ain't. You know, I just don't think we put enough energy, although uh, Gavin is, a, uh, as you say, a, an honourable exception. Let's find out what's uh, really happening in Berlin and in Paris and all the other important capitals before beating ourselves up about not knowing what's happening in a Strasbourg meeting. Right, wrap up for a couple of minutes. Right, do you, journalists do have to use, and that might shock people to know this. Journalists are members of the public, they're human beings, and they have uh, these, I think journalists. I have to journalists don't want to make their views known, that's fine for me. Um, I think journalists, I like making my views known because I do other things apart from the telegraph, like do debates um, and write uh, commentaries and analysis um, elsewhere. So I think it's good for journalists um, to have views. That's not to be con- confused with my, what I said about having to go against the grain to report. George alluded to it, he's still known as that dreadful Euro skeptic, um, <laughs> working for the FT, the head of uh, the Bureau. Um, there from his period there because he went against the grain of how the EU wants to be uh, kind of presented. That's what I meant that to report it, you have to go against the grain and the gnat and the west of those um, institutions. Just very, very quickly on the, the sort of European Parliament, part of the sort of disease of the uh, EU institutions, in, in the European Parliament, the second biggest group um, uh, it used to be called the Party of European Socialists, but still the European um, Socialists. Um, but because they're not adversarial, because they believe in the project, they voted through the fiscal pact, the two pact, the six pact, the jargon. But basically, instrument uh, legislation, which is binding, um, which is pretty hostile to what we conventionally have known as social democracy in terms of spending programmes. So, Social Democrats in the European Parliament voted to institutionalise austerity because it's the European project and they didn't want to go against uh, the European uh, project. It's about some suspension of adversarial uh, uh, politics, which is a big um, problem to me um, with um, the EU. I really agree with the comments people have made about there being so much more um, to Europe, and that's why you need to have correspondence in each of the main European uh, capitals. I mean, there are only two newspapers that I think covered um, the journal election as well. One was the FT and the other was Wall Street Journal, uh, Wall Street journal Europe and of course the Economist. Um, because they have good correspondence, good people on the ground who picked it apart, looked for its meaning. What is the meaning of Merkel? Where is Germany going? What, what does Germany uh, mean nowadays? Um, so yes, there's far more to Europe um, than just 
and the institutions. And in fact, the focus on the institutions is quite dangerous. We've apparently come out of the Eurozone crisis because there is some institutional stability in the Eurozone institutions. There is not a pretty economic picture in the Eurozone, if you look at the real metrics in terms of real GDP, fixed capital formation, investment, and all the rest of it, the picture is, is, is pretty grim. But because there's institutional st stability, and because everyone is fixated to these bloody institutions, they think it's all over. So I'd yeah, be the first person to say, let's step away from the EU and have a you know, long, hard, good look at Europe. Bruno, thank you. I've, I've been looking at three watches throughout all of this, and they all say vastly different signs because uh, <laughs> they all now agree that we've overrun. Yes, we're going to have to call it, call it a day. Can I just thank the four panelists, and particularly if I may thank Nick and George, who have uh, left behind the George of the reshuffle to uh, <laughs> agree with us tonight. But thank you all very much indeed.